Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. Adam, it's been a while since we've done a podcast on the latest news and there's certainly been a lot of stuff that has happened in the last few months that we haven't talked about but there was a big event this week that we're just gonna dive into a little bit last week late friday early saturday colonial pipeline had to shut down their operations after suffering a ransomware attack and these guys transport a lot of fuel for the east coast they have about 5,500 miles worth of pipeline. They provide about 45% of the fuel for the entire East Coast. And then over the weekend, so this week, Monday, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration issued a regional emergency declaration, which affected a lot of the states on the East Coast. The attack was attributed back to a ransomware group called Darkside. And some early indications said that they operated out of Russia, although our government said that there was no indication that the Russian government was involved at all. It's kind of just one of those ransomware groups that operates within a nation, and there's several of them that operate out of those countries out there. Today, it was reported that the entire ransomware operation was shut down. Darkside basically said, we're out of the game. Uh, Their servers were seized. Uh, Crypto currency in their wallets were transferred out. Um, This was reported by a statement from a rival ransomware gang called Revil. And the dark side organizers even released their decryption tools for companies who have been affected, who haven't paid them the ransom. So they basically said that they're out of the game. Although I have my doubts mainly because I think that they're just kind of regrouping and probably rebranding, emerging as maybe a smaller faction of some sort. After the takedown, what was interesting was that Revil, the rival ransomware group, put out a statement saying that they're imposing new restrictions on who can be attacked. So these ransomware groups basically have affiliates smaller groups that operate using that strain of ransomware. So it's associated with the larger organization, but it's a smaller affiliate. Well, Revil has a bunch of affiliates and they said, well, now if you're going to attack a target, you one must gain permission to target any organization and you're no longer able to target anyone that works in the social sector, healthcare, education, Um, or any government sector state of any country. Darkseid actually also had a similar type of, if you want to say, ethical statement. They, They didn't want their affiliates to target anyone in medicine, funeral services, education, nonprofit orgs, and governments as well. So these ransomware as a service operations, you know, they've historically run kind of like a, as a free for all, But now, you know, you can see these guys kind of tightening down with these restrictions. And as well as, you know, it's becoming a high profile thing. So even a bunch of the Russian uh, cybercrime forums started distancing themselves and saying, hey, we're banning you from talking about ransomware. It's, It's a bad publicity thing. We don't want you talking about it. So I, I think you know, over the years, these things have grown to such massive operations. And, you know, maybe with all this publicity, these organizations will start to kind of break up. But I don't think that they're going to just wake up and be like, oh, we shouldn't be in the ransomware game anymore because it's getting all this attention. I think they're going to just break up into smaller groups, rebrand with new names, maybe update their ransomware with new variants and type of stuff. So yeah, that's that's my thoughts on that. You, you know, this makes me think of, to use another organized crime example, the mafia, or at least how the mafia is portrayed in Hollywood movies, which, you know, has questionable accuracy at times, although 
my understanding is films like Goodfellas were actually pretty decent. Um, one concept in, in any mafia movie is that whacking other people, in other words, murdering other people is bad for business, quote unquote, bad for business, right? Um, if you're just kind of laundering money and selling drugs or whatever, like nobody really cares. But when you start bumping people off, it gets too much attention, you know, and this is kind of like that. If you go shake down a bunch of medium sized corporations that honestly have not invested in cybersecurity and they have cyber insurance and the insurer pays like, I'm not saying that's a victimless crime. Like I'm not taking the bad guy's side here, but I'm trying to think of their perspective and why they would put these restrictions in place. And honestly, attacking those kind of targets is bad for business. Um, if you go just pick off again, you know, fortune 1000 companies and, and try not to get too much attention and they don't really deliver like a societal good. Um, that's going to keep like, again, government agencies, uh, cross government action from really getting spun up because nobody really cares. And again, like, I'm not trying to be flippant here, but I'm just saying in terms of like spinning up like a large response from like another nation. Um, if you go after medium size widget company X, um, compared to like, if you shut down the hospital, that gets a lot more attention. And I think that's the angle here is they're trying to fly more under the radar. And there are plenty of targets, uh, that will just pay you your cyber ransom and you go on and go shake somebody else down that doesn't necessarily uh, have detrimental effects on society and therefore doesn't get that government or law enforcement attention. I didn't think of it like that, but that definitely makes sense from their their end. You know, I even saw a tweet on these organizations. They they actually even have customer service that you can contact to help you pay or negotiate the ransom payment through Bitcoin and whatnot. Mm -hmm. One of the responses was, you should get basic endpoint protection, enable MFA get an email security gateway that that was the response from the customer service of the ransomware group and it was like if you're not doing these little things the answer was no one's going to bother targeting you i mean there's these low-hanging fruits right that, that you talk about like there's plenty of targets and so there's no real need to attack these critical targets that will kind of elicit a major response from government or law enforcement well, and, and your other point too is is something that is often articulated in the cybersecurity space, which is to avoid kind of these ransomware as a service attacks, which to be clear are very different than like targeted nation state type attacks. These are just more of who can we go bump off and, and make some Bitcoin. Your goal isn't necessarily to to use the analogy of like, you know, how do you outrun a bear? If you're in a group of people, you just don't be the slowest one. It's kind of like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, as long as you are not the easiest target to attack, if you have some attacker cost associated with it, where it's going to take time or it's going to take a zero day, or it's going to take a lot of effort. Generally, they're going to go move on to somebody else. Who's just not doing it. Somebody who has an enabled MFA or isn't using a secure email gateway or whatever. So th those are like two separate, but I think interrelated points here when we're talking about, again, these ransomware as a service orgs that <laughs> Again, it's just about making money. And if you raise the cost of the attack and it's going to take too many man hours or too much effort or require some novel effort as opposed to run of the mill tools, just go find somebody else because there's plenty of them. Last year, there was a commission called the Federal Cyberspace Solarium Commission that was chaired by Senator Angus King and Representative Mike Gallagher. And the result of that commission published a, a document that is a very uncomfortable read. It basically, in a summary, says that the U.S. is dangerously insecure in cyber and that we are very susceptible in our critical infrastructure to attack. And the industrial sector and you know even healthcare last year during the pandemic were appealing targets because those are critical infrastructure and services that have this incredible return because they can't be down for a long time. The need for availability is really, really strong and you can't afford to have them down. So most of the time people end up paying to get their stuff decrypted. 
And there's some areas that are even farther behind, like pipeline security. In this case, you know, last year, CISA released a document that basically said there are ransomware groups that are targeting pipeline operations specifically. And, I mean, pipelines are difficult to secure in general. You know, they're older systems. A lot of the networks lack segmentation. They have very, very large networks that cover a huge amount of distance, you know, like 5,500 miles in this case. And there are regulation gaps, you know, because refineries and companies are, they sometimes do have regulations. Pipelines themselves don't receive that same type of regulation. The Department of Transportation regulates the integrity of the pipelines themselves, and TSA provides those regulations, but they're more like guidelines, and the pipelines themselves are not subject to any type of mandatory regulations. So that all basically adds up to we can do whatever we want to try to make as much money and keep this going and not have to worry about it because no one is forcing us to implement security features. Right? There's no sense of urgency to change anything. It's worked for 50 years, and it's fine, and we're making a ton of money off of it, and there's no reason to do anything new, right? Well, this is a, a subject that is, of course, in the news a lot right now as we talk about infrastructure in the United States and the need to invest in it. And it's kind of a related subject as far as investing in our infrastructure and the cybersecurity behind it. Um, you think of the severe cold in Texas a couple months ago and the near failure of the Texas power grid and, and how it demonstrated a, a lack of confidence or a lack of disaster recovery or ability to handle anomalous scenarios with grace and integrity the w and availability the way we'd expect it to. Um, and obviously that wasn't a cyber attack. That was just, you know, a really, a really severe weather event, but it's all related. And it, it highlights the need to have regulation around our infrastructure end to end because other infrastructure is really regulated, like, um, power generation and electricity transmission. Like I I've had some of those customers at Microsoft and they're, they're extremely conscientious of cybersecurity and, um, really, really, really important to them. And I'm not saying like a pipeline, it's not important to them, but again, they might not have government regulators breathing down their necks and forcing them to do it. And we kind of found a weak link here. And I think you touched on something else that was interesting too, as we've continued to, as we talk through these, like think through attacker mindset and why targets are attractive. You said it, they can't afford the lengthy recovery that would be necess necessary if you are restoring from backup. It just takes too long and it's not a valid option. So essentially you just pony up. And those are attractive targets for attackers because they know they're more likely to pay as opposed to some other orgs may say, we're not going to pay. We're going to restore. We have a business continuity plan. We do a DR exercise annually. We're ready for this. Um, they might try that. You know, I worked at a couple of different financial services companies before I came to Microsoft, and one of them was really, really, really mature in DR, did it annually, was really good to go. I would be willing to bet they would be less likely to pay versus the other one um, had not had an in-person DR exercise in many, many years and had not practiced it. And I don't even know if had like really good plans. And, and thankfully, since I'm naming two, I'm not calling out which one was which, um, but they would probably have been, you know, behind the eight ball a lot more. So as as attackers you know you want to find those because that's how you get paid and so it's interesting to think about ones where availability is so important to their operations it's interesting that you talk about dr because when this happened you know our company executives talked to my boss and said hey you know this is in the news what do we have you know and we're we have the basics right we're doing all those things patching endpoint protection email security gateway mfa right you know, those are the basics across the board that that most people should be have uh, should have at their company but then the question is is okay what happens if we do get hit with ransomware what is our dr plan and to be honest you know that was something that we needed to research and 
since I've been in the company, we haven't had an actual DR exercise. And mm-hmm. that was one of the things that I learned when we were talking to Tanya Jenka about in her book. She talks about DR and she says, you know, practice it. Know <laughs> what you what you need to do when you have an incident if it comes to that and you actually need to recover systems. Or, mm-hmm. you know, in her case, she was talking about code. If it gets compromised, you need to recover code. But it's the same concept when it comes oh, to sure. You know your servers and and your your infrastructure within your company. Like you should have backups of your AD controllers. You should have backups of your critical servers that are running your applications. So, how do you restore that? Are they online? Like, mm-hmm. did they get encrypted too with mm-hmm. the ransomware? So it's stuff like that that you know you may not think about because you know just like uh, in real life like you may think you're ready for a fight but you know it's once you get punched in the face <laughs> for real then then you really know if you're ready for the fight or not isn't, so, isn't that a Mike Tyson quote something about everyone thinks they're ready for a fight until they get punched in the face or something like yeah, that yeah exactly yeah um yeah i mean the great example about that with with dr and as i always point out backups don't mean anything unless you can recover them and you have that plan and you have that process and you know how to do it. You can be like, we backed up everything. We're on top of it. Our backups are taken nightly. Fantastic. How do you get back to a functional state? That's the part where the rubber hits the road. And that's mm-hmm. the part you have to practice and put into practice. It can't just be theoretical because there become questions real quickly of like, what's the order of operations? What do we have to do first? Where do we start? And if you haven't vetted that out and you're trying to figure it out on the fly, um, in a high stress scenario, you're not going to have a good time. Yeah, we had Gavin Ashton on a, f- uh, a few months ago now, mm-hmm. and he has a blog about the NotPetya mm-hmm. ransomware incident, where he you know went through that at Maersk. And if you read through his blog, he talks about that order of operations, like where do we start, right? Like we have just one copy of a domain controller, and how do we you know? And I think he ran it on a Surface was actually uh, in that story. Like they had one copy of the main controller and it was copied to a surface and they literally ran that to spin everything back up. But yeah, I mean, it's, you, you got to at least have a plan and hopefully practice that. Um, and this isn't something that's going away. I mean, ransomware, if you follow cybersecurity news, ransomware is in the news every week, every week. And this attack on the Colonial Pipeline was literally a movie you know, die hard where they, they attacked the nation's critical infrastructure using cyber warfare. Mm -hmm. So everything these days is connected. I mean, there's very, very little nowadays that is not connected to some sort of network. It's very rare to find air gap systems nowadays. Um, in most companies, according to the world economic forum, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure pose the fifth highest economic risk. Um, and, you know, these attacks are just becoming the new normal, like across sectors like energy, healthcare, and transportation. Ransomware is up about 300% just this year. And as I was prepping the notes for this podcast today, uh, there was some more news that Ireland's National Health Service, the HSE, had to shut down all of their IT systems following a Conti ransomware attack. And so, you know, that involved hospitals canceling their outpatient visits. There was a statement put out by um, the government saying that there would be a significant disruption in services. You know, my wife is a healthcare provider. I asked her what would happen if Epic went down at her company. And she said uh, my job would be severely hindered, right? Like her, the standard of care, the um, the way that they keep records and order tests and all of that. I mean, it's all electronic. So this isn't going away and, you know, companies really need to really start putting cybersecurity as not just a something that we have to do. It's a cost center. I mean, that's really got to be centralized and internalized as culture as part of that company. You know, you, you brought back up colonial pipeline and one of the things that's interesting is we've had this whole kind of discussion back and forth here is attackers kind of avoiding, you know, attacks that are quote unquote bad for business, but at the same time, they're attractive when they have needs for high availability. So you have that conflict of uh, that colonial pipelines, interesting. And Andrew, you made this point on the pre-show before we start recording that gasoline is such a visceral thing. And if you've, 
I mean, if you've turned on a television in the United States, you've seen any time gas goes up any amount, they, they send a reporter over to the local gas station. They're sticking a microphone in people's face. Oh, what do you think about the new, you know, the new gas prices? And, you know, somebody complains about them and, and it's, it's constant in this country. It's a very, very popular subject and a popular local news story. It just always. And so it's super visceral because when you see lines, when you see, sold out gas stations when you see four or five six dollar gas prices um people react to that they respond to that and so they might have maybe picked a wrong target here because i think it's going to tie into a, a discussion that wasn't in response to this but was certainly um convenient timing that the president also signed an executive order that established some new regulations or at least guidelines uh, for how federal government agencies should modernize their cybersecurity posture. And are we ready for that subject now or am I jumping the gun a little bit? Yeah, go for it. Well, Andy, I think you, you put a good summary in our show notes here as, as we're kind of talking about them from, and, and I'll let you do the summarization, but I will say the one thing that jumped out to me when I read them as somebody who certainly talks about this all the time and my job at Microsoft as an enterprise security executive, always talking about zero trust architecture. And that phrase was said in this executive order had to be 20 times. And I was kind of smiling about that because certainly it articulates the need to move to cloud services that adopt that kind of posture. And it, it was, was honestly, I thought a really good executive order and, and some really common sense ideas for improving uh, cyber posture in the federal government, which again, will have spillover impact to private industry because so many private industry uh, organizations, they're like government contractors and they have to align to certain government principles like the cybersecurity uh, maturity model certification CMMC uh, that they're forced to align with in order to do business with the federal government. But I think also as, as federal agencies modernize their security posture, there's going to be an expectation that anybody they do business with comes along for the ride. And I can tell you, this is like a sea change because I've had organizations that I've worked with who have been government contractors. And this is not like many, many years ago. This is literally two years ago. I had a customer that was like on premises, everything. And you'd be like, why, why aren't you guys going to the cloud? You know, don't you see the value? Don't you um, want to do some of these cool things you can do? And like, we can't, we're a federal contractor because of DFARS and blah, 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 regulation, this regulation that, by the way, I'm not an expert in this stuff. Um, we can't. And we would love to, but we just, there's, there's a potential for this kind of data and we would need this kind of handling and, and it doesn't exist or our contract doesn't allow it. So we can't. And, um, it certainly feels like that's going to change a lot as the result of this executive order. So any, can you kind of give our listeners a brief summary and what's all in it and, and your take on it? Yeah, I definitely think if you're in cybersecurity, you should read the executive order because it is one of the most well-written executive orders that I've read. I haven't read many, but this was pretty detailed, like Adam said. A couple of things jumped out at me. You know, one of the things is that the executive order is going to start requiring IT service providers, including cloud hosting providers, to start sharing information about cybersecurity threats and breaches with the, the federal government. So it's going to open up more information sharing across the board. And that may be something that some organizations don't want to do, but I think that sharing of information is important. Modernizing, you said, the government to a zero trust architecture, they're actually requiring everyone in the federal government, all departments to um, enable MFA encryption for data at rest and in transit. And they're putting some guidelines over the use of cloud services on, on what you can and can't do with that. Another call out in the executive order that I thought was really interesting was around code development. So supply chain security, best practices for critical software that's being used. They're going to come up with some sort of like an energy star program. Essentially that it's like this software was developed securely. And so it's been you know signed off by this program, uh, kind of like the energy star program where it's you know certified to be this efficient for energy 
They're going to establish a cyber security, a cyber safety review board that includes federal and private sector members that they're going to convene after a cyber security incident to assess the attack, provide recommendations, also share relevant confidential information with law enforcement. So stop there for one second before you go on. What's super interesting about that cyber safety review board, we have boards like that for so many other things that the federal government oversees, like the FAA, the NTSB, um, that review like aviation incidents or, or major accidents or um, OSHA or all sorts of different government agencies that come in. Anytime something really big and bad happens, there's a comprehensive review, there's a study written up, there's lessons learned, and stuff changes as a result of it. And it's amazing to think that we haven't had this yet, where we haven't had some sort of centralized government agency that says, man, we just had solar winds happen or some other major incident. We should get together. We should get all the experts together, review all of the data end to end, build a comprehensive story of what happened, and then take away some lessons learned that we can change policy and strategy and implementation moving forward. And so this is the first time I'm seeing this because I, I skimmed the EO, but I didn't read it end to end. But that jumped off the page at me to the point where I had to stop you because there's so many other industries and, and again, oversight behaviors that the federal government does that it's almost jarring to think about we haven't had this yet. And it's awesome we do now. This is great. Yeah, that's, that's a great call out. The EO also wants to create standardized playbooks for a government agencies when they're responding to breaches and cyber attacks. And, you know, I was in the military. I've worked in the federal government before. The federal government is actually very fragmented. You know, each department has their own, essentially, employees, HR departments, you know, uh, individualized departments that kind of have their own policies. And so this is really nice where it's like, okay, we're going to create one standardized playbook for every single federal government agency across the board. So that's also one of the great things about this executive order. And then finally, um, you know, just trying to improve the detection and remediation of uh, vulnerabilities, they're going to deploy a centralized EDR solution um, across the board as well, which I thought that that was ambitious. <laughs> Seeing how big the federal government is, to have one standardized tool like that is uh pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of good there. The other one that I didn't pause you on as you, as you went past, but is also interesting is kind of compelling it providers and OT providers, including cloud hosting providers to disclose and share information about threats and incidents. And we'll even say the B word breaches uh, that they're aware of because today I know Microsoft has defined policy on when we disclose things to customers and, and what criteria have to be met before there's a disclosure. Um, this is probably going to change that to some extent where there, there might be uh, a, a bigger likelihood of disclosing to the federal government and potentially even, you know, I'm sure that's a little different because again, it's the federal government, uh, but sharing information that's pertinent with law enforcement too, to, to help kind of learn from that incident and um, be better prepared for the next one. So I think all the different providers out there, if they share a lot of their telemetry and insights and experiences with these incidents, um, certainly that's a, that's a positive thing too. So having, it, again, you know, it's an executive order. It's not like a law that has gone through both houses of both houses of Congress and signed by the president, but it's still something that, that has some teeth behind it, compelling organizations to maybe be forthcoming with um, the events they've experienced in the past. And that's a positive thing too, um, for sure, because otherwise organizations are going to act in their own best interest and um, share what they're legally required to share um, and probably not a whole lot more than that. And so this, this is helpful that it does compel more sharing. So what do organizations need to do, you know, in, in light of all of this information? I'm going to start with an unpopular opinion. Be prepared to pay a ransom. I know that there are companies out there and there are people in our line of business who say we're never going to pay the ransom. But right now there's ransomware gangs that are 
encrypting data and then they steal the data and then they threaten to release the data if you don't pay. And so, you know, that's more incentive to like pay quickly because even if you're like, oh, I'm going to restore from backup, well, they're going to release all your information on, you know, their public website. An interesting statistic that I found was 70% of businesses hit by ransomware end up paying something to decrypt their data. And, you know, as a cybersecurity professional in an organization, you got to be honest with yourself, with your boss, with your C-suite, other stakeholders in the business on how you would respond to a ransomware attack. And if you're clear and pragmatic about those circumstances that you would possibly pay a ransom, you can then make more meaningful plans that when you get hit or if you get hit, how you're going to react and, and maybe end up paying. Cause then, you know, if you put that out there as an option, you can budget for it. You can um, have a, have a way to broker that payment, maybe not through your own or even have a uh, legal and uh, PR statements, you know, prepared. It was interesting because we had this conversation with my boss when there was a couple of hospitals that were hit by ransomware. And one of the questions that he brought up in a team meeting, he was like, do you think we should have a Bitcoin wallet with some funds in it? And honestly, I was like, it might not be a bad idea. But then at the same time, you know, for kind of like shielding the financial part of it, I was like, well, you know, maybe that's something that we want to work out with our cyber insurance provider. Right, mm -hmm. like they would be the broker or uh, median to uh, transfer those funds back and forth. But I think people need to be honest and be prepared to pay a ransom. You keep like putting the ball on the tee for me here with some really interesting points, and I totally agree with everything you just said. And this ties into something we talked about a little earlier in the show. I'm brought up DR. If you've done business continuity planning, if you've done disaster recovery exercises or not, and then you just laid out all the things that are going to try to, you're going to try to do in the fog of war, like your systems are down. You can't do anything. How do you even communicate to the CEO? Everyone's working remote right now too. Like, can you imagine the fog of war in these scenarios where you can't even have lines of communication open because nobody knows where to go, how to communicate? Do you spin up a Slack? What do you do? Uh, those are all great questions, right? And then you're going to figure out like, well, who's setting up the Bitcoin wallet? Who Who's going to submit the claim to the cyber insurance? Who's going to do this? Um, who's going to write these statements? Uh, Blah, 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 blah. There's so much stuff here. Um, I, I agree totally. Be pragmatic. If you haven't done a DR exercise in the last year, you're paying the ransom. Let's just call it like, like it is. And if that's the point, then you should have a ransomware payout strategy like documented. And I know that's probably not the most fun thing in the world, but like, do you want to be trying to stand up a Bitcoin wallet in the, in the heart of the moment? And it, who is anybody, anybody who's ever tried to put like United States dollars into Bitcoin, that's not an overnight process that like takes a day or two. You got to wait for stuff to clear. And I especially imagine if you're trying to spend like millions, it might take even longer. So, um, these are things you should have figured out ahead of time. If you have done disaster recovery in the past year, then maybe you can really make the conscientious decision that, hey, we're not going to pay it unless, you know, we miss, we fail to hit these milestones. You know, we're going to try to do it on our own, but we need to have um, active directory backup within six hours. We need to have exchange backup within 12 hours and on and on and on and have that laid out. And if you start to miss those milestones, then you have like a drop dead time where it's like, okay, this is taking too long. We've lost too much business. We're just going to pay. Um, but this should all be spelled out and it shouldn't be ignorant to the fact that Andy, you said the number 70% of organizations pay. Um, you should be prepared to do what 70% of pure organizations do and that's pay. So what's that look like and have all this thought out and prepared ahead of time. And, it was reported that Colonial Pipeline paid roughly about $5 million or 75 Bitcoins to DarkSide. And I just found this article that I thought was a funny note that the decryption software that was provided by DarkSide was reportedly so slow that Colonial Pipeline still continued to use its own backups to restore the system. So they basically paid $5 million for nothing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
Well, they're criminals. I mean, it, it was funny. You talked about like, you should be willing to pay because they might release your data. It's like, yeah, you, you know, your word of honor here with somebody who's, you know, a thief. Um, that's the question that too. Right. I mean, so that's, I think probably what's driving the other 30% is why should we pay these guys? Who knows they're, they're even going to follow through. Um, but everyone has cyber insurance today or almost everybody does. So. Yeah. I was watching someone respond to this and you know one of the things that they said is we need to start de incentivizing cyber criminals to to continue these attacks by not paying them. I but, said that on this show like a couple months ago. Yep. But it's well, it's a tough thing though, right? Oh, because it is, it's it is. you know if you're in that position, what are you going to do? Like if you put a regulation in that says no United States company can pay a ransom, I mean, you got to have something to help these organizations out when this happens. Right? Do you know how many companies like literally can't recover from this? Like yeah. not don't want to, not like it's going to take too long, but literally can't, right? And so you're going to write a regulation that's that's literally going to put an organization out of business because they can't continue operations. Yeah. That's not so good. So it's a, it's a tough one. Yeah. I mean, we want to de-incentivize them by not paying, but at mm -hmm. the same time it's not it's not feasible. Um, well, and, and you should I, do DR for other reasons than just ransomware, you know, sure. you have a lot of other reasons to do it. And, and I know a lot of orgs have kind of been focused on bigger and better things right now, but hopefully as we, you know, return to normal here, um, we, we get used to doing stuff like that too. One of the other points that I wanted to make is that, you know, there's a lot of collaboration that needs to happen within an org. I think traditionally when one part of the organization like operations or sales or something is like the tip of the spear, the one that makes the money. Whereas like IT is kind of a cost center and IT may not be able to dictate as much policy or procedures that will impact operations or impact sales because that's the money maker. You know, I think that needs to start to change where, you know, IT needs to get a little bit more decision-making ability even if it affects operations, you know, like one of the examples is we can't bring a system down for patching. We're a 24 seven operation. Can't, can't come down for patching. That's not possible. Like you have to have a maintenance window to patch these systems. So I've, I've heard organizations ask and say, there's no time during the month. We are a 24 seven organization. You cannot bring these systems down for patching. I'm sorry. I mean, if you run on computers, you're going to have to patch. That is the bare minimum that you're going to have to do. So you're going to have to compromise operations, sales, whatever it is. You're going to have to be down for an hour or whatever the time period is. We can do it in the off hours. We can do it in a time where it's not going to impact it as much, but we're going to have to do it, right? Or pay for high availability, which might be unattractive as well. But that's another option is we could do high availability, but it's going to cost this much but it's going to reduce your risk of compromise by Y percent and a compromise cost Z dollars. So therefore here's the math equation. You know, that's <laughs> exactly. the, again, that's our job, right? That's what we lay out mm -hmm. and they can make the decision. If they, if they like this side of the equation better, which if you're doing your job, they shouldn't. Um, but if they do pick the wacky thing, that's, you know, that's their choice as long as it's informed decision. So, but yeah. yeah and a lot of the the basics, right? Too like all of these companies, if they're doing the basics, they're gonna not be the slowest person in the pack, right? If you're trying to outrun the bear, so mm -hmm. just patch, have backups, hardening your configurations, actually doing segmentation of networks, like not just on paper, but actually segmenting your networks, um, and then MFA, you know, email security gateway. EDR, you know, those are all the bare minimum basics these days that most companies need to have. You know, the, the other things that are super attractive, like CASB and SIM and all that, I mean, like, they're they're nice to haves for sure, but, I mean, you got to patch. If you're not patching, <laughs> that's, that's you're, you're already, you know, going to be the slowest person in the pack. Mm -hmm. Spot on there. You're just trying to increase your attack cost and make you too unattractive to deal with. I think of, you know, physical security too. Like in, in your neighborhood, um, I have desk to dawn lights on my house, which they were like 
not that expensive. I got them on Amazon. They've got a little sensor on them and they literally just detect when the sun comes up and when the sun goes down and they turn on and off. And so I just leave my outside lights on all the time. But my house is lit up like a Christmas tree. So who's the attacker going to want to hit my house or the house two doors down that is, you know, completely pitch black in the middle of the night. Um, I think my house is an unattractive target. So I have done enough, hopefully, to deter them. I don't need to, like, barricade my doors like it's Fort Knox or something. At least that's my theory. Um, and I think there's there's some analogies there to cybersecurity theory that Andy's talking about, too. And again, you want to keep moving down that maturity curve. Don't get me wrong. Um, and if you're listening to the show, of course, you're interested in that. But if you are getting the basics right, you do protect yourself. But gosh... Every single time we think of the new big incident in the news, it's still something basic. It's still something fundamental. I mean, not a lot of these are like some super advanced, like mission impossible, radical zero day where they broke in, in to the, and stole the knock list or something. You know, it's, it's usually like something silly, even with solar winds, wasn't it like, you know, an admin password was like password one, two, three or something. I mean, it's still just like fundamental and it was public facing like all sorts of crazy, bad things. Every single one of these, they start with something, you know, that kind of makes you go like this, but the problem is you're only as strong as your weakest link and it's hard to have visibility on all the things. So, you know, you do the best you can and you keep trucking forward and keep listening to our show and, and we'll try to help keep making you better along the way. Well, that was a great conversation, Adam. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information is in the show notes. If you have any security topics you want us to talk about or have questions about the show. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.